So uh, this morning, um, the sermon title for this morning is That's What I Thought. And um, the whole idea of it is we're going to take a look at our thought life and uh, first off, the impact that it has on our life, but why it's so important. If I had to give it a subtitle, I would call it um, Taking Control of the Conversation in Your Mind. So, cool. Uh, I'm going to start off just praying a little bit, giving this morning to the Lord, and then we'll dive into it. So, God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be in relationship with you. Thank you that you are a personal God that loves to encounter us, that you don't just stand off at a distance and throw commands our way, but you do life with us. I pray, Lord, that you would um, open our eyes this morning. I pray that you would speak to our hearts, even as you probably already have been through worship and um, through community this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would take whatever I have here in my notes, add to it, take from it, whatever you have for us this morning, uh, that we would just hear directly from you, Holy Spirit. You have permission to blow our minds this morning. Uh, You have permission to blow my mind this morning, God. Thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name. All righty. Cool. So when I was thinking about this morning, and I was thinking about what I wanted to teach on, what the Lord has for us this morning, Uh, I just kind of had this thought um, of how wild our thought life can be, how up and down it can be, and how it's weird that something that's so unique to us, our thought life, can be so difficult to control, right? Um, You would think that since, quote unquote, our thoughts are our own, that we would be able to have full control over them, right? Um, However, um, that's not necessarily the case, is it? If you were to ask, like, we should have control over our thoughts, it might be like, yes, kind of, maybe, do we actually? Um, and that's kind of the question that I want to get to this morning, is what does that look like? Why are our thoughts seem to be so crazy all over the place um, and not always what we would even want them to be? So um, I think that we all can agree that the health of our thought life uh, is very important. Uh, when our lo- thought life is... Um, doing bad or not doing well or as well as we thought it should, um, we see the effects of that in our day-to-day life. Uh, But why is it so important? We've all heard, or most of us have probably heard, the saying, um, there's books on it and everything, that our mind is a battlefield. Um, There's, you know, Joyce Meyer's Battlefield of the Mind, Craig Rochelle, Winning the War in Your Head or in Your Mind, like all these books that speak on this, And there's truth to that. The battles that we win and lose in life are won and lost in our minds most of the time. Now, obviously, there's going to be things that happen that we don't have control of. But our thoughts over those things is what we do have control of. And if we choose in our mind that these things take us out, they're going to take us out. If we choose in our mind that these things that happen to us in life are just part of life, we won't be taken out by them. So that's kind of where we're going to start. Um, and a good example of this, i um, just going to uh, share a little bit from my life and be a little vulnerable here. A few weeks back, a little while ago, um, I kind of went through this really strange season where it seemed like every other day I was getting news of that was not great, like rough news, bad news, family stuff, broader stuff, personal stuff, just things that in nature, are heavy, stressful things. And initially, it was kind of like, all right, like, yeah, that's that, that's that. But it seemed like after like a week or two or maybe even three of this happening, where it seemed like every other day, I found myself in this mindset of like, okay, instead of just, oh, these are things that are happening, I've kind of switched my mindset to like, oh, this is like stressful season. I just kind of want to get through this. And I found myself almost bunkering down, being like, okay, like when is this news going to stop coming and when am I going to start getting good news or whatever? And I found myself being very negative uh, mindset towards the things that, quote unquote, were happening to me in my life in that season. And luckily I have people like Merle around me to kind of smack me out of it a little bit. Um, And he's like, look, like, I want to remind you of a truth. Um, And he showed me some studies that were done, or reminded me of some studies that were done that I knew of, about stress. Um, We all have heard, like, stress can kill you or, you know, affect your health and all that. 
the reality is, uh, studies were done that show that the stress itself is not what affects your health. It's not what kills you. It's your belief of the stress and what you believe about stress that can affect your health and in the long term kill you, right? Um, and that kind of snapped me out of it. Like, okay, like, these things are happening. And the reality of it is we all have things in life that are heavy, stressful, burdensome, or burdenful, however you say that word. Um, and we, when presented with those, have this opportunity to choose what we believe about that situation. Um, and, yeah, this reality hit me, like, really hard. Like, I have allowed a small percentage of my life, a small percentage of things happening to me, to affect the broader whole aspect of my life. Reality was, 99% of my life was great, but this one thing I allowed to bring a negative mindset and negative thoughts into the whole of my life. So just being a little transparent there of where I was, luckily, you know, mentors and Merle and all that kind of helped me get out of that pretty quickly. But cool. So yeah, let's talk about taking our thoughts captive. All right. So 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war with the wor- or as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, demolish arguments, and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought that, to make it obedient to Christ. So here we see almost an attack plan. Like, we do not fight as the world fights. We do not fight with the weapons of the world. But the weapons that we fight with can tear down strongholds, can demolish arguments, pretensions. And we can take every thought captive to obedience to Christ. Now, we've probably heard this a hundred, if not thousands of times, but I've, always, I've often wondered, like, how often do we take the time to look at the context of this passage and how it actually applies to our life? You know, it's easy to quote this scripture when someone's, you know, oh, struggling with lust or whatever it is. Oh, you just got to take every thought captive. You just got to, you know, make it obedient to Christ, which is great, and it's biblical, but what does that actually look like? What does that mean? And why is it so important? I think uh, a lot of times we miss the weight of the importance of this scripture uh, because we just loosely quote it all the time or just hear it um, and let it breeze on by. So um, here we see that the weapons that we fight with have the ability to tear down the strongholds, tear down arguments and every pretension. Pretension is actually allegations of doubtful truth or doubtful value. So in a sense, it's bringing lies and untruths against the knowledge of God. And we have the ability to demolish those. And then it says, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And as I was reading this, um, I had this thought, and I was kind of challenged in how I viewed this scripture Um, I kind of always read it as a lump. Like, those are the four things that the weapons we fight with uh, give us the ability to do. But I kind of had this thought when I was preparing, and God, actually a few weeks back, where God was like, what if you do the previous three by doing the fourth thing listed there? What if taking every thought captive and making it obedient to Christ is actually one of the weapons that we fight with? instead of one of the things that the weapons we fight with does, if that makes sense. Um, and shifting that mindset for me like, kind of opened up this reality of like, wow, like, right here there's this tool that we can use to break down strongholds. A lot of times strongholds are mental barriers. Sometimes they're worldviews. Sometimes they're belief systems that are not aligned with Christ. Um, to break down arguments, things that have been... Um, argued or thought lives that we put up, like, oh, like this can't happen because of this, 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 different things like that. And then also to tear down pretensions, like lies that we have put up against or have heard against the knowledge of God. And we can do all that through 
taking every thought captive. Uh, so that was just a thought I had, and just kind of rolling with it. So, yeah. Um, so last few weeks ago, last few weeks, I was listening to this podcast, um, and it wasn't really on this topic, per se. Um, it was actually a parenting podcast, but um, on this podcast, the guest speaker was Patrick Morley, and he was talking about his book, The Four Voices. And in this book, he presents this um, idea that our thought life have four primary voices that try to affect the thoughts that we think. Like, our thoughts are influenced by four voices. And his quote from his book here says, the four voices in the head, or in our, your head, are the world, the flesh, the devil, and the Holy Spirit. Your job is to figure out which voice is speaking and take control of the conversation. And when I heard this, I was like, wow, like, this is, like, the reality. Like, we don't necessarily get to choose, to an extent, the voices that are trying to affect our thoughts. Our job, though, is to be able to identify them and then, in turn, take control of that conversation. Um, we have thoughts passing by every day, you know, advertisements, media, you know, you're driving down the street, a billboard's going to give you ideas or thoughts um, that we have to then decide, okay, am I going to receive this or just let it pass on by? Um, but it's our job, like that's our job, is to take control of it and figure out what the conversation in our head is going to sound like. Um, so as you might guess, looking at those that list of four things, one of them stands out as the voice we want to listen to, the Holy Spirit, right? That's pretty obvious. Uh, but what do we do with the other three voices? What are, um, yeah, what are we going to do with those? So um, I want to take a little bit of time and just look at those other three voices. What, what are the tactics that they use? What are the voice, like what does their voice sound like essentially? Because in order to take control of that conversation that's in our head, we need to know when we hear a voice, which voice is it? Uh, if we can identify that, it's going to equip us so much easier to be able to pick and choose what we listen to. Um, some of them are very obvious. Some of them are not so obvious. Um, but we will get into some tactics on how to uh, identify, choose, and take every thought captive. So the voice of the world, I'm going to start in Romans 12, 1 through 2, in the amplified version here. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, dedicating all of yourself, set apart, as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your rational, logical, intelligent act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed. So here we see that being transformed is not a once and done thing. You can be transformed today, and tomorrow your mind's already going to need to be transformed again. So it's this ongoing, as we grow in Christ um, thing. So as you mature spiritually, by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves that the will of God, or what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. So we see here that Paul is challenging the Roman church to no longer be conformed, right? Um, and no longer kind of makes this claim that, okay, you are being conformed or you have been, so don't do it any longer. Um, and then he goes on and he challenges, or like he actually starts off, so before he challenges not to be conformed, he's talking about offering their body as a living sacrifice to God. And what I find very fascinating about this is uh, the book of Romans was written around 56 AD. And um, in that time, if you look at the Roman culture, they had a certain belief system that was very dominant. And that was the philosophy of Plato. They believed um, primarily that philosophy as a whole nation. And a very large part of that, um, that would have snuck itself into the church at that time, was Plato's view on dualism, where everything that is material is bad, 
and everything that is spiritual is good. Um, and I heard a teaching on this a little while ago. It's really fascinating to think that as Paul is talking about this not being conformed to the world, that he starts off with this, challenging them to offer their body as a living sacrifice, where in their head, their bodies are bad. Their bodies are evil because they're material. They're of this world. They're tangible. Um, so why would you offer something that is evil to a holy God, right? So he's um, coming in here, and the way I believe that Paul is doing here is that he is right off the bat challenging ways that they've already been conformed to the mindset of the world. He's coming in and saying, hey, this is one area that you've believed what the world has said, but let's try and you know, transform that into the mind of Christ. The world says that dualism is a thing. You know, Your bodies are bad, but here he's challenging them in that. Um, cool. So yeah, the fact that he starts off with this is quite cool, I think. It's really challenged their lens of how they viewed the world and the word of God. Um, so first thing we want to look at of how the world will speak is in the way of social and cultural norms, all right? Um, there are hundreds and thousands of things that our world, our culture, uh, some are global, some are regional, some are by the country, uh, that are set in place so that people kind of, quote unquote, function the same way. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Most of them you don't even ever think about in your life. You just abide by them. Um, some within the United States here that are, might be good is, you know, the social norm that you're out to eat, you're going to tip, you know. Um, that's just expected, and there's not a whole lot of teachings on it, not a whole lot of whatever, but, like, you just kind of know. You learn because of the culture that you're in. Other countries, that's not a thing. Um, so you just kind of know the culture that you're in. So that's one thing that's, you know, neither good nor bad. It's just a cultural norm. Uh, another thing that might be good, wearing a seatbelt, you know, safety. You just kind of know that. And then showering daily, that's a social norm, right? If you kind of forget about that one for a few days, someone will probably remind you. Um, but yeah, those are some kind of like good social norms. There's also bad social norms, right? Uh, in our culture today, language is a large one. You know, like, it's socially acceptable to just swear and curse occasionally throughout. But as believers, like, we have a different standard, a different norm that we need to abide by. Um, another one that is very evident in the United States especially, but globally, is um, living with someone before you're married. Glo like, that's a social norm. Like, oh, don't even think twice about it. But as believers, we have a different standard that has been presented to us. Um, a large one right now that's trying to be pushed, I don't believe it's a social norm yet, and I pray against it that it will be, but the whole thing with gender and all that is there's this huge um, agenda to make it the social norm that, uh, yeah, you get to choose your gender, whatever you feel that day, whatever, um, is a large one. So we see that those are some of the larger ones, but there's smaller ones, you know. Um, entitlement is very ingrained, especially within the United States, that you know, it's all about us. All the advertisements we see is focused on us, focused on me. Um, and that, in a sense, is like a social norm structure that we can fall under if we're not intentionally thinking about our thoughts, right? Um, so yeah, that's one way the world speaks. Another way that they find their voice, it, or the world uh, finds its voice, is through social media, movies, music, um, advertisements, all that is a form that the world is going to use to try and speak to us. Um, you think about it, uh, the shows that are on TV these days, they all push agendas, they have their own worldview that they're trying to make others kind of believe. They won't say that out front, but if you pay attention, there's certain things that are trying to be painted through media. Um, so just be intentional with what you're uh, taking in. Be intentional about how often we allow that worldly voice to come through um, mindlessly. We need to be able to filter that. Um, so that's another way the world speaks. And um, let's see here. 
So yeah, those are just a few. There's obviously other ways the world speaks, but if I unpack all of these voices fully, we'll be here for a while. So um, I'll stick to those two for now, but how do we combat this? Uh, let's look at Romans 12:2 again. Uh, and do not be conformed to this world any longer and its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourself what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we are transformed by the renewing of our minds by focusing on godly things, by focusing on godly values and godly attitudes. So in a sense, to combat the voice of the world, we need to look and train ourselves in the way of spiritual norms, in the way of spiritual mindsets and structures, um, the way that God intended it, the way that God structured it. Uh, If we focus on those things, we'll be able to know what's coming against those. Because if we have no structure there, and we're just taking whatever comes and trying to decide at that moment, like, is this good, bad, what is it? Um, We need something to compare it to. So if we are trained in the way of knowing spiritual norms, uh, that's one of our best tools to combat that. Um, So yeah, so the flesh is another voice that tries to affect our thoughts life. And this one, um, we can't really escape, right? Like you can kind of escape the world's voice by going in the mountains of wherever and never seeing another person again, never seeing another screen, whatever. You can kind of escape the world that way, but your flesh is always there. So Galatians 5, 19, 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, amity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, Dissensions, division, or sorry, huh, dissensions, di- sorry, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Um, so we see a very clear picture here of the th- kind of things that the voice of the flesh is going to use. It paints a picture of what our flesh naturally, like our sinful flesh, sinful nature, that's what it's talking about when it says flesh is our sinful nature, is going to draw to and be gravitated towards, is that list of things. Um, And where it gets tricky is there's a lot of ways that our flesh will try and trick us into following these things. Um, Oftentimes our flesh will speak in the way of feelings and emotions. Now, feelings and emotions are incredible things God gave us, and they're incredibly godly. I would not want to live life without them. Um, However, uh, if we're not careful, our feelings and emotions, when backed and fueled by wrong motives, can really wreck us, can really mess our life up, essentially. Um, A lot of times what will happen is our... Feelings and emotions, if they take control, will tell us what instant gratification, like instant gratification is best. Like, I don't care what happens tomorrow, but in this moment, this is going to feel the best, or this is going to avoid the most bad emotions, or this is going to avoid um, certain feelings that I hate having. Um, When in reality, um, yeah, sometimes you have to go through some of those lesser desired emotions or feelings Uh, Because life throws things at you, right? So that's one way that the flesh tries to get his voice in there, is through instant gratification, avoiding certain feelings. um, And it kind of puts that lens on us of, all right, what is best for me at this moment according to the flesh instead of according to the spirit? Um, So yeah, Uh, I don't feel like we need to spend a whole lot of time on this because, again, if we look at Galatians 5 and that list of what the flesh is prone to, um, that is an incredible way to catch a lot of the words of the flesh. If something lines up with one of those, chances are you're hearing from the flesh, right? Um, And that can be our flag there. So one of the best defenses against the voice of the flesh is found in Romans 8, 6. 
Um, it says, For to set your mind on the flesh is death, but to set your mind on the spirit is life and peace. So again, we see very similar to uh, the previous passage at the end of my last point was focusing on things of the spirit. Focusing on things of, the God, or of God is our best combat against this voice. Um, so the third voice that Patrick mentions in his book is the voice of the devil. Now I just want to give a little disclaimer here that the devil himself is one person. So he's not you know, on all of our shoulders speaking to us. But this is um, kind of like thoughts influenced by the devil and rooted in that. And most times he's going to speak through the avenues of either the world or the flesh or both. Um, But it is kind of funny, like the shoulder angel and devil in the movies, you know. Um, This is, it's kind of, there's a reality to that, you know. There's always going to be those different voices speaking at you. But I just want to spend a little bit of time on the voice of the devil and just kind of, yeah, so we can be aware of the things that are rooted in that. So John 8, 44 says, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. Now, to paint a little bit of a picture here, um, (laughs) when it says that you belong to your father, the devil, he's speaking to a group of Jews that have come against him, and they really just want to get rid of him. Uh, They're trying to essentially kill him. Like This is leading up to the time that Jesus was crucified. Um, And Jesus obviously knew their heart's desire, so he knew that in their questioning, they're coming against him, that this was their heart. So they're like, oh, no, we're the children of Abraham. Abraham is our father. And God's like, if Abraham was your father, blah, 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 you'd accept me. And then they're like, oh, no, but God is our father. And he's like, well, if God is your father, you would not be trying to kill me. You would love me. Um, and, and then he combats it with this scripture. So that's uh, the structure of this verse. But then he says, He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So first thing we see here is that Satan only speaks in lies. His native language is lies. So when we can clearly identify that the voice that's speaking is a lie, again, some of the obvious ones would be lies. You know, if we can identify it, we should be able to kick it out right away and be like, all right, you know what? That's not me. That's thought influenced by the devil. going to get it out of here. Um, So lies is going to be our first red flag. John 10.10 says, the thief, which is the devil, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. So the second flag that we need to be looking for is found in this scripture. Are our thoughts life-giving, and is it giving us full life and those around us? life and full life? Or are they bringing some sort of stealing, killing, destroying? Are they tearing up or building up or tearing down? Um, So that's the second flag we need to look for, is if there is any kind of destructive motive behind the thoughts, any kind of bringing someone else down so that we can be built up, that is a red flag right there. And if we learn to identify these, um, the more we do it, the quicker we'll be able to do it and the easier it will be for us to take control of this conversation in our heads. Um, But yeah, so that's not all the way that the devil can speak. Those are some of the obvious ones. I want to take some time and read through a little bit of a larger chunk of Scripture here, but it's Luke 4, 1 through 13, and it's when Jesus goes into the wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days, and Satan is there, and he tempts him. Um, And... I think this is an incredible way to kind of see some other ways that the devil might be trying to sneak his voice in there. But also we see an incredible picture of how Jesus himself combats these temptations. Um, And, I mean, it's great for us to apply to our own life. All right? So starting in verse 1, Jesus fooled the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during these days, and at the end of them was very hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. So right here we see, um, again, as I said, Satan will usually use 
the world or the flesh or something in that realm to, as an avenue to speak to us as well. So here we see Satan's coming and saying, hey, you're very hungry. I know you are. You haven't eaten in 40 days. So how about you just come on over here and make yourself a nice dinner out of this pile of rocks? And um, what, you know, Jesus had the ability to do, but Jesus knew that it was a temptation and came against it with Scripture. He came against it and said, no, my Father has already said in the Word, it is written that man shall not live on bread alone. Um, so this, uh, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. If you worship me, it will, be, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So here, um, humans love power. Humans love to be in charge, love to boss other people around a little bit. Um, and Satan kind of, kind of dives into that a little bit here. He's like, hey, all of this you can be in charge of. All of this you can have power and authority over. Um, but then Satan, or Jesus replied, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So again, he responds with scripture. But another aspect here that I thought was really interesting was Jesus knew that future, he's going to have a new heaven and a new earth. So he already knew all this will come back to him, right? So the temptation that Satan kind of uses here is the temptation of expediting the processes of God, um, which I never thought of in the scripture before, but God kind of highlighted me, to me as I was playing is like, we can get a glimpse of what our future holds. We can get a glimpse of what God's called us to, giftings kind of point us in the direction of, all right, like, you know, for myself, I was very young, like single digits, when I first got a word spoken of me that I'll be a pastor someday. Um, and from then till two years ago, there was a lot of opportunities where as in the flesh I could have muscled my way in and kind of put myself in that position before I was ready. Um, and there was definitely temptation to do so. And that's kind of one of the ways that Satan will try and trick us. He'll try and trip us up uh, maybe not doing something bad, but doing the right thing too early or doing the right thing out of season. Um, so you need to be intentional with hearing from the Lord timelines on things. So uh, picking up in verse 9, the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. And then this is where it starts to get a little tricky is Satan himself then quotes scriptures. It says, For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So another thing that Satan loves to do and has brought division in the church all over the place with it is twisting scripture, twisting the word of God to mean something entirely different than it actually means. There is whole belief systems structured around some of these lies. There's whole religions structured around some of these lies. And if we don't know the actual word of God within context, we can easily fall into this. You know, it's easy to hear a scripture and have your personal preferences and twist that scripture to back up your thoughts, to back up your beliefs. And Satan loves to do this. Like, he loves division. He loves to destroy things, right? The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. If he can destroy churches, if he can destroy relationships by twisting scripture, he will, right? So, um, yeah, we need to be intentional with taking scripture when we hear it and applying it to context and what the word says as a whole. So, yep, let's see here. Sweet. All right, so yeah, uh, when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. 
So that is the three voices. We got the world, the flesh, the devil. But what about the fourth verse, or the fourth voice? What's cool is the fourth voice, the Holy Spirit, is actually the antidote and the solution to the other three voices. Uh, If we can learn to identify and hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, hear the voice of God, that is going to help us um, come beyond those other three voices. Um, So yeah, in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, again, I read this a lot earlier, but with the context of thinking of um, weapons against the three voices. They have divine power to demolish strongholds. Again, that's broken belief systems. That's um, structures of the world that hold us captive to a certain standard that is ungodly. Um, To demolish arguments, those things that we reason against, um, those arguments that we put against what we know or might not know yet, but and then uh, also to demolish every pretension, every lie and falsehood. Again, the f- devil is the father of lies. He's going to try and pile lies against the knowledge of God. So we can demolish those three things by taking every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. And how do we do this? And that's simply by listening to the fourth voice, the Holy Spirit. In John fourteen twenty six, it says... But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. Right here, John is saying that the voice of the Holy Spirit will teach us and then help us remember what he has taught us. All right? So if we um, allow the Holy Spirit and allow the voice of the Holy Spirit to teaches things. We might not always have those things on the forefront. We might not be able to always sit down and think of every scripture we ever read, right? If we did, that would be incredible. I want to meet you afterwards. If you can requote everything you've ever read, that'd be amazing. Um, But what happens is it is then stored inside of you, and the Holy Spirit can bring it to remembrance in times of need. Like when Jesus had those verses to combat with the devil was saying to him in the wilderness, like, the Holy Spirit will bring those things back to you in the moment of need. But the funny thing about the word remembrance is that you have to experience or learn something to be able to remember it. If I stand up here, with the exception of maybe like two or three of you, and ask you what gift I got when I was 14 for Christmas, and told you to remember that, can you remember that? No, you cannot remember that because you were not there, and I never told you. If you were there, you might be able to remember it. If I told you about it, you might be able to remember it. But you cannot remember something you never experienced or heard or read, right? I can tell you that I got a snowboard that year, and it was incredible, right? Um, But now that I told you that, if I ask you to remember it, you can remember it, right? So uh, this is a really um, crucial aspect of this verse to grip a hold of, is if we want the Holy Spirit to bring... Um, scripture and revelation to our mind and help us remember it, we have to first get the scripture and get revelation from the Lord in us to be able to remember it. Um, And it says that the Holy Spirit will teach us. So if we're faithful and intentional, like he'll unpack this for you. You know, you sit down to read, it's not just going to be some words on the paper. Like the Holy Spirit is faithful to teach you through it. Uh, so yeah, it's so important. And with that, like, it's so crucial for us as believers. Like, I want to challenge you, and maybe step on some toes here. If this morning is the only scripture you're getting for the week, you're doing it wrong. I'm sorry. Like, our, yeah, our, not duty, but like, I am honored to have this letter from the Lord, the word of God, in my hand, that any moment of any day, I can sit down and hear from the Lord. And the reality and the weight of that is incredible. But so often, we as believers just mark it off as like a duty. Mark it off as, oh, I have to read my Bible, you know, 7.3 minutes a day, and then I'm good. 
But if we see this as our weapon against the flesh, against the world, against Satan's attacks on our thought life, if we see this as that antidote, like, we should be in this thing constantly, you know? You have three minutes between, you know, whatever task of the day. You're whipping this out and reading the few verses, right? And that is such a crucial part of our relationship with God is he has given us so much, so much wisdom, so much knowledge here that he can bring back to deliver us in times of need, right? He can bring to our remembrance, but we need to do our part in getting it in us. Um, I love this quote from Billy Graham. It says, most of all, let the word of God fill you and renew your mind every day. When our minds are on Christ, Satan has little room to maneuver. Um, yeah, that is powerful. When I read that, I'm like, whew. Like, if we are putting the word of God in our mind daily, like every day, not just Sunday, not just at life group and Sunday morning, but like every day, there is little room for Satan to maneuver. Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So worship team, you can make your way up. Um, yeah, I'm going to read another scripture here out of John 16, uh, verse 13. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. So the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, will speak truth and guide us into it. All right? Um, so not only does the voice of the Holy Spirit teach us and help us to remember he also guides us. If we are intentional to learn the voices in our head, if we are intentional to be able to identify the voices and take control of the conversation that's in our mind, we can then know what the Holy Spirit is speaking and follow it. If our minds are just clouded voices and clouded thoughts that we have no idea where they're coming from, we're going to have a really hard time knowing what steps to take um, or what direction to go but if we just take the little bit of work that it takes to learn to identify, um, it changes things. It changes how we walk. It changes how we talk. It changes how we interact with our bosses, our coworkers, our children, our spouses. Uh, so what is our move from here? What do we do? Like, how do we move forward knowing that there's voices trying to affect our thoughts, knowing that the Holy Spirit wants to teach us and bring remembrance? So for starters, I think this is probably the most important part of this, to kind of level the playing field, kind of level a plot to start from, and that is we need to be brutally honest with ourselves, and dare I say, maybe someone else. Um, we need to be real. We need to pack it out and just be like, hey, like, in this area or these areas, my thoughts are terrible. They're trash, you know? Like, I've listened to social norms and just have kind of buckled under the weight of expectations the world has put on me. Or maybe, you know, my flesh, you know, I'm avoiding these things because I know it won't feel good in the moment, so I'm just doing what feels good now. Um, so we have to be real with ourselves. And if you are vulnerable enough, uh, when we go into a time of ministry, grab someone and be honest. Be like, hey, in this area of my life or these areas of my life, my thoughts aren't good. My thoughts are great. And being able to identify that and know the areas you have to work on will bring so much um, freedom and encouragement. You won't, don't quite think of that way to confess, you know, tough stuff. But like when you get things off your chest and they're not secret anymore, they lose their power. So, that's the first thing we can do this morning. Um, and like some questions you can ask yourself is like, all right, think of specific areas. Like what, what are my thoughts towards work? Do I think it's always stressful? Do I think I'm always behind? Do I think I'm underperforming? Like those thoughts 
are not thoughts of the Holy Spirit, right? So you should be able to identify if you want to just work down a list of specifics. Do that instead of trying to figure out a broad, all right? And then um, there's a scripture in Psalms 139 verses 23 to 24 that is actually kind of structured as a prayer. And when we actually pray it, it's kind of, I don't want to say a dangerous prayer, but it's kind of a big prayer. Like, you have to mean it when you pray it, because God's faithful to hold up his end of this. But if you're willing this morning, I want to kind of read this out as a prayer. Um, If your heart's not there yet, and you don't want God to seek your thoughts and search your hearts and thoughts, and like, okay. But I would really strongly encourage you to do so. Um, So you don't have to read it out loud, but if you want to, go for it. But I'll start here. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there are any grievous ways in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So God, that's our prayer this morning, God. God, we pray that you would come and search our hearts, search our thought life, God. Any area that is that we've been thinking outside of the structure you have for us, any negative thoughts of the world, the flesh, or Satan, I pray that you would just come and uproot them. I pray, Lord, that you would give us, uh, yeah, just the strategy and the technique on how to grow our thought life to be more healthy, to be more rooted in you, Holy Spirit. I pray that we would learn to know the voice of you. God, I pray, Lord, that we would know your voice and we would follow it. Yeah that we would know the shepherd's voice and another's we will not follow. God, I pray, Lord, against any uh, condemnation that anyone here this morning that is like, my thoughts aren't good and um, shame tries to sneak in, I pray against that right now in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that there would be no shame in this room, that there would be no condemnation. If conviction comes, God, that you would back it up with hope and with grace and with excitement to do better. Earlier this morning when we were doing morning prayer, I got a vision of a white sheet the entire size of this room and just kind of like fell. And I didn't think it was for this morning, but God just brought it back to my memory. And um, the word that I got with it was like, God is laying peace over this congregation this morning. That he just wants to blanket us with peace. So God, (laughs) we release you to do that. I pray that we would walk out of here in peace no matter what life has thrown at us this past week, no matter what life has thrown us the past months, years, whatever it is, no matter what our plate looks like in life right now, that we'd be able to walk out of here in peace. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for watching this teaching. I hope that it impacted you in some way. If you enjoyed this teaching and would like more teachings like this, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and get updated each time we post a new sermon.